Today is January 14th, and I, my name is Kyle Wads, and my partner is Chris O'Connell, and we're interviewing Bruce LaPointe in the Vietnam War. Um, what is your full name? Uh, Bruce J. LaPointe. Uh, when were you born? Uh, March 28, 1949. Where? Uh, Tupper Lake, New York. What education did you have prior to your military service? Uh, prior to military, I had a 10th grade education. Did you have any job before you entered the service? Uh, yeah, I worked for uh, Bell Lawning and Tent Company and you know, things like that, you know, the odd jobs really. Mm -hmm. I worked as a cook up the beaches. Uh, when did you enter the military service? Uh, September of 1967. Uh, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. What branch of service did you enter? Uh, the Marines. Why did you want to be in this branch? I well, had respect for the Marines I brought up, you know, if you, you know, get to serve your country. Mm -hmm. Before you went to, to basic training and things were, what were you expecting to go in? As, as far as we mean going. Like, basic training, what did you expect from basic training? Uh, uh, I ended up being a mechanic. You know, that's what I wanted to go in for, I to be a mechanic. Where did you go for basic training? Uh, uh, Paris Island, South Carolina. What did they teach you then? Uh, they taught us all the, the fundamentals of you know well, your your marching, uh, how to take care of your clothing, your equipment, uh, how to take care of all your equipment, your rifles, you know anything like that. Mm -hmm. Plus you had your you know you had uh, PMI instructors teach how to fire the rifle and what to do and what not to do and. Um, now this is being your first real experience with military. What did you think about it? When I first got there, yeah. we opened the buses up. I didn't know what the hell I was doing there. <laughs> I mean, you can see these guys. The drill instructors waving to you. You know, like, hey, you know, really nice. And when the bus door opened up, you thought the gates of hell opened up. <laughs> That's just what it was like. Uh, what units or ships were you assigned to? Uh, I was assigned to the Third Marine Division. and the 10th Artillery. What types of equipment did you have? Uh, you know, with Deuce and a Half, five ton trucks, Deuce and a Half Jeeps, all that kind of equipment like that, and you know, any motor transport vehicle. Mm -hmm. When did you leave the United States to go to Vietnam? Uh, it was 1968, I can't remember the exact month. What area was your unit assigned? Uh, Quang Tree. Uh, was the terrain difficult? Uh, during the monsoons it was. The rest of the time was really bad. It was you know sandy and hot. Mm -hmm. It was really bad, you know. But during the monsoons it was real bad. Uh, what were your duties while serving in Vietnam? Yeah, combination of duties: uh, mechanic, uh, run a parts room. Uh, uh, scrounge parts mm -hmm. because parts were really were scarce sometimes. You know, and you meet a lot of people and you can do a lot of a lot of horse trading. Yeah. You had a bottle of Jim Beam, you get anything you want. And then you know, just normal like standing guard duty at night and things like that. Because mm -hmm. you know, even though you had your job during the day, you still you didn't do it every night. Yeah. But you still had guard duty and bunker duty and got to be ready to go any time of the night. You you know, you never get a good night's sleep over mm -hmm. there. Uh, how'd you feel about them? Were they easy, hard? As far as what you mean. Duties. Well, duty were bad. You know, it's a job, like anything else, you know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you do your job. I mean, sometimes they're pretty difficult when, you know, you, you figure you need a break and you couldn't get one. But, you know, that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. uh, could you explain what your daily schedule was like? Yeah, most time you get up, you know, get up in the morning. You know, this is just a daily schedule. You get up in the morning, um, you know, get what you got to get done, go to the mess hall. Uh, then you have formation. And then from there you go on to wherever your, your duties are for the day. Either you're going to go to your regular job or you get picked for, for guard duty that day. Mm -hmm. What was your regular job? Uh, uh, diesel, uh, yeah, mechanic, and I ran a parts room. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have any combat service? Uh, not really. You know, I mean, we got, we took firing and stuff on the lines and stuff like that, but not where I was really out in, you know, mm -hmm. out in it. Uh, did you receive any injuries? No. Agent Orange? Yeah, I'm under Agent Orange. Could you explain what this was? 
It's a dioxin chemical they use to clear out foliage. It just, you know, destroys the plant, it suffocates it, and mm -hmm. destroys it, and it's not around for a while. Uh, how do you keep in touch with those back home? Uh, mostly mail. And a couple different times we get the call with them, call those bars calls. You get the call on a, a shortwave radio. They'd set it up like Griffiths, they had it up here. And my parents would be up there, and you know, and they would set everything scheduled up, and we could talk for like like five minutes, you know, but you had to, it was back and forth, you know. Mm -hmm. um, what was the food like that you were fed? You know, not bad. I mean, it wasn't you know, it wasn't mother's cooking, but you know, it was you know, most of the time it was pretty decent. Mm -hmm. You know, it just all depends on if you're in a permanent location. After a while, things got permanent. The food was better. If you had to move around and stuff like that, then you're you know, the the, the food could be just you know, sea rations or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, could you explain your relationship with the uh, Vietnam, the, the Vietnamese people, the North Vietnamese people? Well, that's a rough one. <laughs> Um, the, the people themselves that live around the area and work around the area, they're just typical, you know, farmers. I mean, they're, they're poor. Mm -hmm. You know, they do their everyday job, you know, I mean, whatever they got to do to survive. I mean, they have to feed their families and take care of their families, and that's their biggest project. You know, we're the least of their worries what, but we had a lot of good with some of them. You know, we had them that worked in our compound. Uh, I got to go into one of the villages one time when they, they take the people back. And it was it was a surprising when I get in there how you know some of the villages do look. Mm -hmm. I mean they're not. They were fairly. This village was fairly clean. You know nothing extravagant, but you know it was clean. Yeah. You know stuff like that. And then uh, we had one. The one I remember is a, a, a papas on there. He really amazed me. Uh, cutting cutting plywood. He'd sit on the board. They had a, a rack they built. He'd sit on the board, and he had his bow saw, and he used his big toe and, and second toe for a guide. And he cut that. You, it amazed me how straight that board was. You just, you know, sit on there and slide back and keep moving. Wow. And we had some other ones there. I mean, there was, you know, it's hard as, as being Americans. You know, now it's different than when I first went over there. When you first trained, you hate them all. Mm -hmm. You know, because you can't trust them. And the problem you run into is, is our background for trusting people and liking people actually gets in our way. Mm -hmm. You know, you get over there and you want to like these people, and you know, that person will be the person who cuts your throat. That's right. You know, and it's really hard, and you know, and just like that's the biggest thing. How about the South Vietnamese people? Well, that was the South Vietnamese people. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. The North Vietnamese people, I never got to meet any. Uh, what people do you remember the most for your military service? Uh, some of my friends in the service that I had. You know, people you met and you went to boot camp with, and you know, you always wonder, you know, how many of them made it back. <coughs> What experience left the greatest ex greatest impression impressions on you? Oh, well, experience left the greatest impression to actually see a dead body over there. You know, that's when you realize that it's, you know it's real. Mm -hmm. Did you see any medals, awards? Uh, just the uh, you know your regular ones are your National Defense Ribbon, your campaign medal. I got we had a, a meritorious citation given to us, and the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry was given to us. Mm -hmm. uh, could you explain how you get them? Mm -hmm. it's, you it's them? Just for being in the, well, the national offense you get for being in the military. Everybody gets that. Mm -hmm. uh, your campaign medals, you have your, your Vietnamese campaign medal stuff, which you do when you're over there. You get uh, over there for different periods of time, different campaigns and everything, and you'll get different stars if you're for, uh, so, I forgot what it is, if it's a month time, or you know, how many months you're there, or whatever. And the, the cross of gallantry just from the organization, you know, we got it as for our support and what we did over there when you go through different places. And mm -hmm. uh, how'd you feel about the rotation system? I didn't think it was bad. You know, it was 12 months and you're out unless you wanted to extend. Mm -hmm. You know, unless you really, unless you had a critical one last. Other than that, 12 months, you're on your way back home. Did you want to return? Yeah, I did. I, I went for a second tour. I went home for 30 days leave and came back. And when did you return? When you finally returned from Vietnam? Oh, geez. Sometime in 19, let's see, late 1969. Uh, after you came home, after you came home, uh, what jobs did you have? Oh, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think after we came home. Uh, I worked for, well, when I first came home, I was an instructor for the last two years I was in the service. I taught reserves, I taught diesel mechanics to reserves. And that was still while I was in the military. Mm -hmm. 
Then after that I worked for American Motors. And my father and I opened our own business after that, you know, automotive repair shop. And then I went, you know, then I got to, I went to welding school and... Go to college? Times. Yeah, I went to college. I, uh... I got what I need for my uh, oh I think you're a bachelor. For my associates, I need two credits. Mm -hmm. and for my bachelor's, I need like a semester and a half. Just never got back to you know, finishing it. Mm -hmm. But I got my GED. I got my high school diploma in the service. Did you think it was difficult to get back into everyday life when you came back from Vietnam? Yeah, it was. The hardest thing was not moving around. I drove my wife crazy. I mean, about every you know. Every two or three months, I wanted to move because mm -hmm. we were just used to moving all the time. You know, you never really stayed any place too long. Uh, did you main, maintain any contact with your friends? You made in the service? Not in the service, but I, I, you know, I met other friends through a different organization I belonged to. You know, that were in Vietnam. You know, and we stay in touch once in a while. Mm -hmm. um, did you see any movies or read any books about Vietnam? Uh, I read you know, a couple books, and, and I forgot what the name of it was there, but uh, I saw the movie Platoon. And, you know, I actually wasn't in the infantry, so I can't tell you, mm -hmm. but I had really close friends of mine that to this day are really screwed up, you know, they met. And, you know, they said that's what it was out there, and I wouldn't even doubt it that that's what it was. Um, what do you think about Platoon or the movies you, or the books you read? I think what happens is I think Platoon was a shocker to everybody. I think it shocks the American people to see what really went on and what you would do, you know, to, to, to save yourself or whatever you had mm -hmm. to do. The books and stuff out there, I think <clears throat> a lot of the stuff can't decode stuff too much. Um, there's no doubt in my mind, you know, that, I mean, we helped Ho Chi Minh defend against the Japanese. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind, what do you call it, you know, they couldn't defeat them. There's just too many other, how can I say, people who had other interests. Mm -hmm. uh, how has your military experience influenced your life? Uh, well, I'm here today, even though I got a cold and I told you, you know, I normally I would have said no, but I never give up anything. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, just one thing I did learn in the service, you don't quit, you know, that's it, just, you know. Uh, and uh, would you recommend going into the service? Yeah, I would. Marines? Well, it's like this. I recommend, you know, for, the first thing I would recommend, if you got a high school education, find out who's, what kind of education you get in the military. Mm -hmm. Because once your military time is over, what are you going to do? You know, if you go in the military and you're infantry, what do you do when you come out? You know, you're, you know that's the thing there. See what you get. I mean, you know, if you. I mean, my personal opinion is, I, you know, I've seen the different branches of service. And I see what happens, and my thing would be if they want the best training to keep themselves alive, is going to Marines. Mm -hmm. But as far as you know, getting a training and a skill, you know, that's the two things I would look at. Uh, could you explain your uh, that area where you your unit assigned? Uh, our rear was a Quang Tree. Yeah, could you explain. And pretty much what it was is uh, we're a supply unit. Mm -hmm. uh, we kept, we had to keep everything, in other words, if you had a vehicle broke down, they couldn't fix it up front, they brought it back there and, you know, hopefully we get the parts for it. And that's where meeting a lot of different people from other units, you know, sometimes we couldn't get parts, I could get them. Mm -hmm. You know, and these guys would give them to me. Um, everybody works together. A lot of times you find out we knew the officer's mess was getting stuff that we weren't getting. So, uh, we trade things off, we get them. Do you see any, like, frontline attacks or? Only on our only on our bunkers. I don't only on our lines at night. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a couple of them happen there. We we had one guy that you know that shot on the lines and stuff there. But other than that, we were you know we were pretty fortunate. Yeah, I mean, when you had to like, uh, fix something, you were never under attack. Or... We've had mortar attacks and, and stuff like that, but it just you know we've had mortars hit inside the compound or like that. But that goes on all over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna explain. I brought this in. This is my platoon book. And yeah, this will pretty much guide you through on what if you, you, know, you want to take a look at it or what you want to do there. It will show you uh, basically what we went through, you know, from the start to beginning and give you an introduction. Mm -hmm. um, oh, one thing, we couldn't fly the American flag over there. I don't know if they ever told you that. Couldn't fly the American flag. So what would happen is, is you'd write your congressman for your state, and the state would send you, send you a state flag. Mm -hmm. And you could put that up in your hut on the wall. Really? You could have American flag on the wall inside or like that, but on your equipment and stuff, you couldn't fly a you know, American flag. Why is that? Oh, because 
we were in a, uh, how would I put it? We were in a foreign country, and whatever, I, you know, it's really hard to give you a straight answer, but that's just what we were told, that no one flew American flags. Mm -hmm. I didn't think it was right, but hey, who are we to argue? We're just, you know, we're just there to do what we got to do. I met a lot of good people over there, you know, as far as, you know, service. I got to go to Australia on R&R, &R, which you know, was a nice place over there. Um, I brought some pictures like in here of different guys in the unit. Myself, picture from when I was in Australia. You can even see some of the old cameras. I don't know if you guys ever heard of the old uh, Polaroid Swinger. Mm -hmm. and that's what these photos, some of these are from. The Polaroid ones, my father sent me a good Polaroid after I was over there. You know, there's some pictures here of the ammo dumping down how it blew up. Uh, the tank unit, the tanks over there. A uh, picture of the platoon. And my car I bought when I came home. You know, 69 Mustang. I was only home for 30 days, so mm -hmm. the military pay currency, that's some of the stuff I had. That's not, that's Confederate. But these here are just military pay currencies. Um, here's a picture of when it's near the monsoon. I actually darkened it. I had that as late as I could get it. Another picture of China Beach down in Dedang. We had to stop there and visit some of our friends on the way to R&R. &R. And they had made. Mm -hmm. I mean, things were just... Uh, if they had to explain, I couldn't believe it. You know, these guys were on duty. Of course, it was a lot more secure down there. We walked in their huts. The first thing they hit you was the air conditioning, and they got mattresses. And, and you know, we go in there and we're looking around. And, you guys hungry? Yeah. Okay, we'll get you something to eat. They had their food delivered because they were security. Mm -hmm. They had their food delivered to them. The refrigerator was full of beer. That's all they had in there. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. As far as picture myself, there's a couple pictures of myself in there, you know, whenever you, know, you want to. You can take some pictures of that there and see how well they come out. You might want to flip the plastic back, maybe it'll show up better. You know, when you do them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are just pictures from one of the USO shows we had there. There was no... The only person I didn't get to see over there at the USO was Bob Hope. I got to see him when he did the, uh, the show for my son, when my son graduated from the Navy up in Michigan. Mm -hmm. I got to uh, you know, see him up there. Yeah, that's me there. Well, that's about 85 pounds later. And you still make contact with people in the platoon? Not really. I was looking at my book today and saying, you know, I should just try to find out if any were even still alive. Yeah, they were like longer. A lot of them out of my unit, out of my platoon, were infantry. Uh, the only thing that saved me from going uh, when I went over there, the, uh, the Marines down in the Nang were getting hit really hard down there. Mm -hmm. And the only thing they couldn't take me for is because I was already assigned, but I already had it. Uh, I was a mechanic. If I was infantry, they'd have been gone. Mm -hmm. Were they like in lot rotation system? Uh, you know, I, wouldn't, I couldn't really tell you down there. Yeah. Um, they're supposed to be, everybody's supposed to be the same. And, you know, brothers aren't supposed to be in combat zone at the same time. And it took us yeah, probably seven, eight years ago. My brother and I both found out we were in Vietnam at the same time. And he was in the Marines, mm -hmm. but he was in Da Nang. He got hit hard. He was well. He got hit. Somebody. He got hit in the head. I don't know what you know, what happened to him and stuff. But he, you know, he, you know, he, he works for the post office in Utica now. But uh, he's in infantry. Yeah. Uh, what was your most memorable memorable moment? Oh, uh, well, two of the first one, they first dropped you off in Vietnam. They drop you off on a runway, and they tell you you got to go to this place, you report for your unit. It's five, six miles down the road, and you don't have a rifle or a weapon of no kind. You know, and it's the, the first river. Well, then the, the other one is they told me I had to go deliver some equipment up north. Now, who's going with me? Nobody. <laughs> you go outside that gate out there, and you're in no man's land, and I'll tell you what, when you're driving that deuce and a half, you just keep that floor and you don't stop for nothing. You know, and they tell you don't stop for people, don't stop for nothing. Mm -hmm. And like, what did you feel when you first, how long, like, how long did you have to go? Oh, uh, as far as what? Driving. Well, just one day, just out there and back, drop the stuff off and go back. How long did that take? Oh, probably a couple hours each way. Mm -hmm. And you didn't encounter? No, nope, I was fortunate. 
But when I got up there, they were encountering when I got up to where they were at, because you know, they had uh, um, big guns up there. Scared the crap out of me the first time they went off. You see the whole tent just pucker right in from concussion. Wow. Did you, like, if you were attacked, would you, like, have to, did you have any weapon? Oh, yeah, I had my own weapons and everything with me, yeah. What you were carrying? Oh, uh, M16. No, what you, uh, in, oh. like, in a truck? Oh, the truck? Yeah. Uh, food and ammunition. Mm -hmm. Okay.